ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from Gadigal land. This is ABC News Daily. When you're watching sport on a weekend, whether at a professional, amateur or even school level, you'll always hear the crowd gasp if a player cops a blow to the head. We know it's not good for the brain, especially a child's, but do we really understand the extent of the damage it can cause? This week, a Senate committee recommended a national strategy to reduce concussion in sport. Today, we speak to a former AFL player who has probable CTE, a brain disorder likely caused by repeated knocks, and a neuroscientist about how we could make sport much safer. Hi, I'm Sean Smith. I played for North Melbourne and Melbourne between 1987 to 1998. Sean, take me back to your time as a professional AFL player. You're on the field for the Melbourne Demons, I can imagine it would have been thrilling to play the game at such a high level. Oh, it's something you can only, words sort of can't describe the way the feeling is in front of tens of thousands of people playing a game that you love. There's a lot of hard yards away from the the field, Mm -hmm. a lot of pain and a lot of hard work to get there. But yeah, MCG with 70, 80,000, it's, uh, it's something that you have to experience. It's uh, awesome. Yeah, I bet it must be incredible. But then I guess, Sean, there were also, I mean, you mentioned the hard work, but there are also the injuries and the knocks to the head. How many times would this have happened to you, do you think? Well, injury was my middle name there for quite a while. Especially at North Melbourne, I I even had the wonderful experience of rupturing the liver, getting a shirt front from someone, which was part of the game back then. I didn't even get a free kick, believe it or not, which it was play on. But yeah, definitely the concussions have have wreaked a lot of havoc with me. When I sort of analyse, go back over time and talk to people and watch a bit of video, and I I reckon I've probably been knocked out probably 14 times. And that's not even counting the other concussions that you get, and and that's not even on the footy ground. When when we trained, we went hard at it. Mm. I mean, unconscious fourteen times. It's a lot of times. What happened after that? What was the treatment? Just rest. There's been a few that I've seen. One against St Kilda comes straight to mind. I don't even know about it because I've seen it on video. Mm. Got knocked out and then carted off on a stretcher and then I come back on after half time. In our final in 87, when I was at North, I got whacked pretty hard. I'm not sure whether I got knocked out or not, but I was pretty heavily concussed. I only know this because I watched the video. I actually don't even remember playing. You come off and then come back on after half time. Oh, my gosh. And watching the video, I played like I was concussed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, that was part of the game back then. It was the old toughen up type thing. You, you're right. You're right to go. Unbelievable. So your career, it comes to an end eventually. But when is it that you start to notice that things aren't quite right with you? I sort of really noticed changes sort of in my 40s, mm-hmm. just getting angry really easily. And obviously depression was... Mm was starting to hit me pretty hard, points where you'd be in bed for three or four days, just couldn't get out and, you know, you had some silly thoughts about self-harm and, yeah, it was really a tough time and, you know, I had a, a couple of attempts at ending, ending it all. Your career ended a while ago and you played a while ago and things have changed, haven't they, since then? Knocks to the head, they are taken more seriously. But when you watch the AFL now, or any sport for that matter, and you see players receive a knock to the head, what do you think? Is enough being done? No, no, clearly not. I mean, I think the AFL has done a good job cleaning the game up, you know, the cheap hits, the horrible sling tackle head first into the ground and hit high shots. But... I think of Jeremy Cameron about three, four, about a month ago. 
Geelong star Jeremy Cameron has thanked fans for their support after being released from hospital following a sickening on-field collision. Cameron and teammate Gary Rowan collided in the opening quarter between Geelong and Melbourne, causing play to stop for 10 minutes before Cameron was stretched off the field. I was at the game because my son plays for Melbourne and then Jeremy Cameron got knocked out really badly. <laughs> And he was out for quite a while and then came back, missed two games, which is nowhere near enough. And in the first 15 minutes of the first quarter, he got a whack in the head. So I'm thinking, it's, this is just madness. Yeah. And then he came back on the ground after that and got another whack. So I'm thinking, I don't think anyone's really listening. Thanks so much, Sean, for that, for telling your story to us. If Sean's story has raised any issues for you, you can call Lifeline on 13114. So now to you, Fatima Nasala. You're a neuroscientist. Tell me a bit more about this condition, CTE. There's a lot we don't know about it, but we do know that it's really bad to get repeat concussions, don't we? Yes, definitely. So sorry to hear about Sean's situation CTE, as we know of as of now, is only diagnosed post-mortem. But at the moment, we sort of more understand a lot more about the symptoms that are associated with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, what we call probable CTE, which seems to look like early dementia, Mm. Alzheimer's disease in terms of symptoms that are similarities, but it's not the same thing. Now, we don't obviously know exactly what the causes are for CTE, but a very, very high risk factor is repeated impacts to the brain Mm -hmm. over a long period of time. You can imagine if you had one impact to the brain where the brain is injured and it hasn't had time to recover and you have smaller contacts or smaller impacts to that specific area in the brain, then these would accumulate over time. And this is what we think is causing chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Yeah. So that's what Sean mentions is he's knocked out and then he goes back on after half time. Yeah, so it's repeated concussions. Now, one thing that I would really stress is that it's not that one concussion where you're knocked out and it causes CTE. It's that knockout and then you've got subconcussive impacts to the brain, vibrations when you haven't allowed the brain to fully recover from that impact and reverse or heal itself for that time. And as you mentioned, we call it probable CTE because it can't be diagnosed until the person is is dead. And Fatima, it isn't just professional athletes, is it, that are at risk of this? Your research is currently looking at amateur sports and even school-age kids playing footy or rugby. It is a serious risk for children, isn't it? I do think if it's not managed well, then yes, it is a serious risk. And so this is where our focus is on children because children their brain is developing. It's a very vulnerable stage. You can imagine it as there's a set trajectory where the brain is developing, learning new Mm. things, and then you have an impact. And if you have repeated impacts, it probably offsets that trajectory onto a completely different way of development. And so this is where we want to take caution. It's important that the children are taken care of and managed right so that you can prevent these longer term consequences. Let's look, Fatima, at this six-month Senate inquiry that's just handed down its report this week. It investigated concussion and head injuries at all levels of sport, and it's come up with 13 recommendations. How will those recommendations help, do you think? Look, I think it's a fantastic step forward. I do think that the recommendations are in line with the evidence that was put forward to the Senate. Among those recommendations are establishing a national sports injury database, more funding for research, calls on sporting codes to provide athletes with insurance for head trauma... And the so we put recommendations for why we needed more research. We put recommendations for, for why we needed a national database. We put evidence forward for the need for more investigation into children and longer term studies where we can identify how we can reduce that risk and how we can reduce the burden. And I think all of that has been put forward in the recommendations, which is, which is great to see. Another recommendation was to consider whether government should enforce return to play protocols because, of course, at the moment, sporting codes set their own rules. On a general level, at the moment, there's a 12-day rule 
that's based on medical clearance. It's based on what we see of symptoms clearing. However, we don't know, and we, we probably are sure that the brain does not recover at the same time frame as when the clinical symptoms recover. And this is one of the studies that we are doing at the moment. We're trying to use the most advanced technology like neuroimaging. We're trying to use blood biomarkers, saliva biomarkers. We're trying to use clinical data to identify when is that critical point where the brain recovers from an injury. And so you need the brain to recover fully before you go back to contact sports. And so you can't rely that purely on clinical symptoms. So there should be a margin whereby we know that that person's recovered clinically. How long more should we wait before we know that it's actually really safe for them to go back to play and be at higher risk of getting other concussions or other sub-impact injuries? And I think the codes are working with the evidence we have, but it's very, very vague what the evidence is at the moment. And so erring on the side of caution would probably be a lot better. All right. So the AFL, it has a 12-day rule. So a player has to sit out for 12 days if they receive a concussion. It's 11 days for the NRL. But what you're saying is that might not really be long enough. Yes. It takes the brain longer to recover from what we've seen. Is something that we need to investigate to identify mm. when is safest to go back. Yes. In the meantime, Fatima, for amateur sport players, for parents who are worried about brain injury, is it still safe to play contact sport at that level? What would you say to them? Look, I would say that there has to be awareness from parents. We've been working with schools around Queensland for a bit over two years now. We can see that the self-awareness is still not there on how serious this condition is. I think we really need to embed into our culture that this is very important. So one example, and I just reflected on this the other day, my son had a knee injury while playing soccer. And, you know, he trains on the Monday and the Wednesday and on the Tuesday, he said, maybe I shouldn't train tomorrow because my knee might get worse so I can play the game on the Saturday. He'll never say that if he had a head knock. And I think we really need to embed into our culture that a head injury is just like a knee injury. You need to let it rest, otherwise it is going to get worse. Dr. Fatima Nasrallah is a neuroscientist at the Queensland Brain Institute at the University of Queensland. Sean Smith is a former professional AFL player who suffers from probable CTE. The AFL is facing a number of class action lawsuits brought by former players who are suing the league for damages caused by concussion injuries. This episode was produced by Bridget Fitzgerald, Nell Whitehead and Anna John, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is David Cody. Over the weekend, catch This Week with James Glenday, where he'll be looking at whether the Reserve Bank's interest rate rises have cooled the economy too much. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again on Monday. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.